How are you all doing? I'm so glad. You know, this is a, this is a weird, has anyone else found that this has been like a bit of a weird week this last week? It's like that, that kind of, you know, you have Christmas and, and you all get together and you celebrate Christmas and then, and then there's the next day, which is not Christmas, but it's not yet 2018 and you're seeing the same food you saw the day before and you kind of don't know whether, are you supposed to be celebrating again or are you just, must you just be grateful for the leftovers and you then see the leftovers again for a couple of times and you walk around kind of asking people what, what day is it today, has anyone else done that, what day is it today, are the shops open, are the banks open, am I supposed to be going to work, aren't I, anyone else feel like that, that week, it's that, it's that kind of weird week of, of what is going on between Christmas and New Year, it's really great, it's awesome, I know, it's really, really great, so we're going to tackle um, Jehovah Rapha, another, another name of God today, and we're going to end, be ending this series off today, and I feel like, I don't know about you, but these last few weeks has just been so great, just learning more about the nature and the character of God through Him revealing His names to us, and, um, and you know, it's like in any relationship, you know, the more you spend time with that person, if you're married here, you need to be doing this and you get to know that person, and you learn new things about that person, and they learn new things about you, your relationship grows. Your understanding of them grows. Your knowing them grows, and you being known grows in understanding these things and understanding. And that's exactly what I feel like God has been doing in these last few weeks. So we're going to be delving into Exodus 15 today. I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture. It's always good in church to read scripture. Amen. So we're going to be doing a lot of that, but I want to pray first. Father, thank you for this opportunity today. Thank you for your word, which is just there to give life and truth to our bodies. You sent your word to heal, Lord God. And Father God, we ask today just for a revelation of who you are, a revelation of of what it is that you've given us access to. And Father God, we just ask for more and more of your presence in every way throughout today and the rest of this year. Not this year, next year. In Jesus' name, amen. This year as well, but next year too. So, has anyone heard, does anyone know what a bog off is? Bog off. I'm not swearing. Anyone heard of a bog off? If you've lived in London, you should know what a bog off is or overseas. It stands for buy one, get one free. Bog off, okay? You're getting bog off sermons today. Hopefully, if there's time. Because I feel like in Jesus, in God revealing himself as he did, in Exodus 15, he was revealing himself as the Lord, our healer, which we're going to look at, but he was, there was just so much more in that chapter, and I felt like there's a, a lesson for us in that chapter for 2018. So we're going to kind of do a bit of both. Is that good? Are you, are you ready to hang out with me a bit there? So if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 15, that's where we're going to be hanging out, or your Huawei, or your Huawei, or your iSung, I mean Samsung. You get it, Sam, I, Samsung, you got it. Or your fruit, piece of apple or your banana or whatever it is that you're looking on. And we're going to read in Exodus 15. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song. I'm going to stop now. Pastor Mike a few weeks ago said to us, whenever you see the word then, you need to think about what was happening before. So let me give you a bit of a background about what's happening here before these people are singing this song. These are the Israelites who've been enslaved for over 400 years. They've just been delivered. I'm just, I'm just trying to set a bit of a scene here. They've just been delivered from a myriad of things in Egypt. The 10 plagues, hail, frogs, water turning to blood, all sorts of things, lice. I mean, if any of you have ever been in school and gotten lice, imagine a plague of it, not just in one head, all over the place. Then they also got delivered from their firstborn being killed by putting the blood of the Passover lamb on the lintels of their doorposts and the angel of death passed over it. So the Israelites have seen all of this. They've been spared of this. They then left Egypt, got to the Red Sea and Moses asked God, what do we do? God parted the sea. The Israelites went across to the other side. The Egyptians followed them. They got drowned So they've seen a myriad of miracles. Do you agree with me? Just being spared from one of those would be cool. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) 
But to have all of that, have seen all of that, have been saved from all of that, hence them singing this song. So they've just crossed the Red Sea. So let's carry on. Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider. He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. He's my God. And I will praise him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Then Miriam, of course it had to be a woman, the prophetess, took the timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels. I don't know what the men were doing, but the women were, had timbrels and they were dancing. And Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. And she goes on and says, the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Do you agree with me that there is reason for them to be praising and celebrating? The Egyptian, the entire Egyptian army was following them. They all got wiped out in the sea. The Israelites got saved. They are now praising and rejoicing. Right? It's awesome. They crossed the Red Sea into what they thought was freedom. Okay? <laughs> they were told that they were going to a land of milk and honey, and they were all excited and glorious, and they were singing this song. And I want to ask us this, first of all today. What do we do when good stuff around us happens. Is this the kind of song of celebration that we sing? Or do we thank the bank manager or the tax man for our rebate? What is it that we do when something good happens in our lives? Is saying thank you to God our first response? Because I think that if we do that, our entire atmosphere around us will change. So the first point that I want to say today is dance and be thankful. This was a picture of the Gosman men last week. <clears throat> Dancing and being thankful. Thank you for allowing me to come to your home and take a photograph. <laughs> if we dance and be thankful, it changes the way we perceive everything around about us. It changes our outlook when we are being thankful and celebrating what God has done, the good that God has done. Pastor Andrew was talking about that in his prophecy. He was speaking about how the goodness of God is the thing that we need to be focusing on. If we focus on that around about us, everything else falls into the right perspective. Not so. Rejoice always, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The reason why I think it's God's will for us in Christ Jesus is because if we get our perspective right, if we are thankful always and pray continually, the lens through which we look through life and our environment is the right kind of lens. It's not marred by our environment. It's not marred by things that may or may not be, be going wrong. The reason why I'm talking about this point, and I want you to remember this point, is because I want us to look at what happens next. <laughs> what happens next in Exodus? So it carries on and it says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara, which means bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Okay, so rewind five minutes. Just think about everything the Israelites had just been through, just been saved from, and after three days, just three days, their response is complaining and bitterness. <laughs> Just three days. I know none of us ever do that. I know we don't ever have good things happen to us, and then when something bad happens, we come. I know none of you do that, but just remember this message for those people out there that do that, right? But there's some things here I want us to look at before we continue. The word sure means wall. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you're doing exactly what God wants you to do? You're following exactly what it is God wants you to follow. You're saying the right stuff. You're doing the right things in your business meetings. You're in a board meeting and you're listening to him and you're saying the right things and at the very next turn, you feel like you faced a wall. Or is that just me? <laughs> I 
<laughs> it happens so often where we feel like these things happen. The Israelites have just been taken from 400, about 430 years of captivity, of being enslaved in Egypt. All these miraculous things have happened. Moses leads them. By the way, they're following God's leading because they're following a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So they're following this. Get through. After three days, they're all like, where is there water to drink? Now, I don't know if you know this, but... I was researching when I was preparing, and a person, a human, which is what we all are, can only live about three days without water. Apparently, you can live longer without coffee. I, I debate that. However, <laughs> you can only live about three days without water. So what's happening here? These guys have been walking through the desert for three days. They see what is in front of them that looks like glistening water. They get to it, and when they flood to it to drink the water, it's salt water. It's bitter. What happens when you drink salt water and you are very thirsty? It dehydrates you even more. You get thirstier. And the people start complaining. I think that these guys, after their 400 years of, of being enslaved, had some healing that was needed. This is some of the healing that I think that they needed. First of all, they needed physical healing. They'd had no water. Do you notice the type and shadow that we've been speaking about of the three days? Someone was on a cross for three days. Do you remember that? <laughs> well, was buried for three days. They had no water. So they needed physical relief. They were in pain. They'd been walking in the desert for three days. Just picture it. I know it's been a bit hot in Gauteng of, the, of late. Just picture it being hot without any water, without any shade, without any relief for three days. This is how these guys felt. All of a sudden, you start sympathizing with their complaining, right? <laughs> they were also bitter. Bitterness is an emotion, okay? And it's an emotion which is the, is the root of this. It's disappointment, it's anger, and it's fear. They were disappointed because they got to the water and it was bitter. They were angry. Where are you leading us? What's going on? I'm thirsty. I want you, you've taken me out of this place. And they were fearful. Is this ever going to end? How are we going to drink? Are we going to die? You've led us out. We're going to die. May, may, we, we should rather go back. The, the Israelites wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to what was comfortable. I challenge you next year, tomorrow, don't go back to today, last year, to what was comfortable. Carry on pressing on. Go on to what it is God has got for you, the promises that he's given you, because they will be fulfilled. But these people were believing a lie. They were believing that something bad is going to happen. What does that show me? It shows me that they needed emotional healing. Their emotions were all over the place. And the other thing that they needed was spiritual healing. Why do I say spiritual healing? They were complaining to whom? <laughs> they were complaining to Moses. Do you remember that song that we read? Praise the Lord, he's great, he's a man of war, he's saved us. Now all of a sudden, here they are. They don't go back to God and say, oh Lord, thanks for all the salvation and the deliverance that we've seen. We've got no war to help. They complain to Moses. What does that show me? That they didn't know their identity. They didn't know the character and the nature of God. They didn't know that they could trust him for the next step, even though they'd done everything up until now. They needed spiritual healing as well. Let's carry on and read what happens after this. So he, Moses, <laughs> cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight. Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I've brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Jehovah Rapha. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees and they camped in these waters. Now, let's unpack that a bit more. First of all, the difference between Moses and the Israelites is what? 
he cried out to the Lord. I know none of you ever feel like that. That's a self-portrait of me a couple of months ago. (laughs) But Moses did what he knew was the answer to everything. He beckoned the mind of God. And he said, Lord, what are we to do? That's what he did. He didn't complain like all the Israelites were complaining. He beckoned the mind of God where he knew the power was. And he said, Lord, what must I do? Where's the water? Help. (laughs) You told me to bring all of these people out. I've seen everything that you've done. You see, this is the difference between the Israelites and Moses. Moses at this point in time is standing on every single victory that he's already seen. When you're facing a tough situation, are you complaining or are you standing on every single victory that you've seen God perform in your life? Because if you look for those, there are many. I know some people, I was speaking to Hotso this morning at the door. The siblings were on door greeting again. And I said said to her, I'm so excited for 2018, but I'm so glad to see 2017 go. Like, I don't know if any of you feel like that. You know what I'm saying? But even when I look back, and Chotso said this, she was looking through her photographs the other day, just of every single from the beginning of this year, of all the good things that have happened this year, of all the memories, of all the photographs that you've got, of time with friends, things that you've done which needed finance, all those sorts of things. Moses was standing on every single victory that he'd seen God do when he said this. So he cried out to the Lord. He was standing on every single victory. Instead of protesting, he was praying. How many times do I, let me not say we, I'll not put you in my boat. How many times do I protest instead of praying? How many times do I complain instead of saying, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Show me an answer. And if all I can say is help, (laughs) Jesus, help, God, help. That's our first port of call to request some help. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise, it says in James. According to that verse, there's only one of two things that you can be doing. If you're in trouble, pray. And if you're not in trouble, rejoice. That's the only option that there is. It doesn't say if you're in trouble, complain, phone your friend, have a moan to them, commiserate with each other. It doesn't say that. It says, if you're in trouble, pray. If you're in trouble, pray. And if you're not in trouble, sing. Celebrate. Be thankful. Those are the only two options that we've got. So we need to request some help. Amen. Right. The next thing that happened is this. And the Lord showed him, Moses, a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. He tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I'll put none of the diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. See, the solution was always in the mind of God. God always had a solution, like he had every time he delivered the Egyptians, the Israelites, he always had a solution. And here again, he's got a solution. And just look what the solution happens to be. A tree. Now in some versions it says a log. So I did what is pastorally correct and I looked up the word in the ancient. And that word tree is tree. Okay, you'll be glad to know. I know it's extreme. I know you're so glad that I spent all those hours doing that. Yeah, Pastor Andrew saying I went to the root word. And and it is tree. Interestingly enough, that word tree is the same word that is used over and over and over in Genesis in the creation story where God made trees, plants, etc. It's that same word for tree. So I know that God doesn't make dead stuff. Not so. Therefore, it must have been a living tree. Okay? So now I want you to picture this. Here's Moses and these guys. They've been traveling three days. They finished. They want water. They're complaining. They're irritated. And God shows Moses a tree. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was shown a tree while I'm hot, tired, thirsty, have people complaining in my ears, and God shows me a tree and says to me to throw it into the water, 
I'd have like a bunch of questions. doesn't tell us that those questions are there, but can you think of some? How do I get the tree into the water? If it's planted and it's a living tree, which I think it was, where's the axe? How, like how do I uproot this thing and get it into the water? There was some obedience and some work required in seeing the, pro the promise and the fulfillment of God. There was some work required to see the promise and the fulfillment of God. When you're in your last moments, your last legs, and you feel like you can't anymore, there's some obedience required to see the promise of God fulfilled. The interesting thing when I researched about this tree as well is that if any of you know a mangrove tree, a mangrove tree is actually designed to take salt out of water. So often you'll find mangrove trees in estuaries and river be between salty water and, and non-salty water. Unsalty water, plain, it's like chips, plain chips, not salted chips. And, <laughs> and that's where you often find mangrove trees because they're able to do that. They're able to take the salt out of the water and make it drinkable. Yet here again, we see another miracle because Moses was obedient and somehow the, he put the tree in the water and instantly the water became drinkable. So the miracle, I believe, happened instantaneously. I believe because it, they were, it was three days. They needed water like now. Otherwise, it would have been like the story would, wouldn't, it wouldn't have made the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like people left and they all died, you know? So something had to happen. That tree, miraculously, as soon as it touched the water, it made the water sweet. It made the water drinkable. Who is it that we know of that was crucified on a tree? We know him, right? If you don't, welcome to church. His name is Jesus. Was crucified on the tree. What if, because we pray and because we dance and rejoice, when we add Jesus to our bitter water, it makes it drinkable. What if that's the solution? What if the beginning of this Exodus 15 is the beginning of what we should be doing, celebrating, getting our, pers our perspective right? And then we pray and we listen to what is being said. And adding Jesus to our stuff makes our stuff good. He makes us look good. He makes your work look good. He makes your parenting look good. All of you are great parents, but he makes it look even better. You know, he makes this church look good. He makes every nation global look good. Because as soon as you add Jesus to anything, he makes it better. He doesn't make it better. It fixes things. He wants to heal. He wants to restore. And the most important thing I believe that he wants to restore, restore of those three points that we had, whether it's emotional, physical, or spiritual, I believe he wants to restore us spiritually. Jesus died on the cross the main purpose was to, because our dad wanted his kids back. Daddy God wanted his kids back. And that's the main reason that healing of our spiritualness is needed. Because he wants his kids back. Amen. And here Jesus, God reveals himself as our healer. Now it's interesting that in 2 John 6 it says, and this is love, that we walk according to, to his commandments. Do you know what God's love language is? It's obedience. All over there we just see Moses had to listen to the instruction and do it. And he made a, he tested them and he said, if you do this stuff, I will bring none of those plagues on you. I'll bring none of those diseases on you and your children. But there was almost a condition to it. There was that thing of being obedient to what God has told us. I want to just share a testimony quickly. I was with a friend of mine yesterday that I've not seen for a while, and her husband was sharing a testimony that he, um, he was actually diagnosed about 10 years ago with a brain aneurysm. So if there's any medical people in the house, a brain aneurysm is like a ticking time bomb in your head. You never know, and it was inoperable. So you never know when it's going to burst, when it, and, and, and the result usually is death fairly instantly. So he used to live his life to the full. He was like, I've got this thing in my head. <laughs> I'm going to just live my life to the full. Four years, three and a half years ago, he married my best friend. 
who lives in London, and I got to see her yesterday, but um, I just quickly flew there and flew back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but he, <laughs> he was just sharing yesterday how his life changed. He got saved about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago. He was on, one of the guys that was on my Engage card, so we were praying for him, so God hears our prayers. He got saved. He started going to church with my friend, and many times people came to him and said to him, I want to pray for your, your aneurysm that I know you've got. And he just kept saying no. <laughs> He's just like, no, I'm not doing it. And these people out of obedience were going to him and saying, Greg, can I pray for you? And he was just like, no, not really. It's been diagnosed. I know I'm going to live with this thing. I'm probably going to die with this thing. It's fine. To cut a long story short, eventually he went and he got prayed for. One day, he heard God say to him, today's the day. Go now and get prayed for. So he went to some of his friends at church and, they asked, and he asked them to pray and they did. And he felt like God did something. He felt something shift. There's only one way to tell whether your brain aneurysm is gone, is to go and have an MRI or a CT scan. So a week later, he did. And in London, they don't normally do these things without you going through a whole bunch of red tape. You know, you have to almost be on death's door, believe it or not, because there was nothing wrong with him, so why did he want an MRI? And he said, I just want to check whether this thing is gone. And there was no trace of that brain aneurysm anywhere. Amen. There was no trace of it anywhere. The weird thing is this, is that, just think about Israelites complaining. He actually got angry with God. He told us yesterday, he said he got angry with God because there was another miracle that he wanted more than that miracle. Can you believe it? This is how, this, picture the Israelites, we're human. This is how quickly things happen. Like he was, he was awesomely excited, yet at the same time he's like, but Lord, <laughs> I've been asking you for this other miracle for four years now, and this other miracle also affects my wife. What's going on? Like, that's the one I wanted more, you know? How quickly we can fall into these things. But the key is that we need to listen to instruction, and we need to take note and do what God is telling us to do, right? Then they came to Elam, it goes on to say in Exodus 15, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they decided to camp there. Good idea. The difference between Mara, where the bitter water was, that was made sweet so that they could drink it, and Elam, where they ended up going after Mara, was only 15 kilometers away. Now you work out in your head, if you walked for half a day, you could probably do 15 k's. Half a day away from their moaning and their grumbling and their complaining was Elam, where there were 12 wells of drinkable water and 70 palm trees. What is the moral of the story? <laughs> keep walking. <laughs> just keep walking. Don't drink Johnny Walker, but just, unless you want to, but share, but just keep walking. You have no idea how close around the corner your fulfillment of your promise actually is. You have no idea how close it is. Don't give up just before you get there. Don't complain just before you get there. God wants to heal us so much that we don't complain before we get there. And that on the journey there, we're doing the right stuff. We're singing. We're dancing. If we're feeling yuck, we're praying. We're not complaining. Don't give up just before your promise and your fulfillment is there because it is just around the corner. It is just around the corner. Perseverance, Andrew was talking about perseverance this morning as well. Did you know that you mentioned perseverance? And, <laughs> and the thing with perseverance, the Bible tells us in Romans, it says perseverance builds character, character, hope. These guys just had to persevere for another 15 Ks, and they would have gotten this in the first place. So God delivered them in that place of where they were feeling bitter, where they were feeling yuck, where they were thirsty, etc., etc., and complaining again, God came through for them. That's not to say God will come through for you in any moment, because that's who the nature of, that's his nature. <laughs> it's who he is. Even when we don't do what we should do, it's his nature. But in persevering, it builds character, and character gives us hope. 
if these guys had had that in them, if they'd just carried on going, imagine the character that would have been built. And I sometimes think to myself, do you think that if they'd done this in the first place, if they'd walked another 15 kilometers in the first place and started being obedient sooner, would they still have spent 40 years going on like a two-week journey? But God was building into them the ability to get rid of the slavery mentality that had been there and ingrained in them for 400 years. And that's what he was doing. So just keep walking. Don't stop. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. See, when Jesus is added to the bitter water, makes it sweet. And it doesn't make it sweet just for us. He fills us up. That, that This morning when we had that moment of infilling, it was just so great because God doesn't fill us up just for us. He fills us up so that we can overflow. <laughs> right? It says there, overflow. Living water. It doesn't stop. There's a never-ending supply of it. If we're plugged into the right source, if we add Jesus to where we're supposed to add Jesus to, he makes all those things good. He works everything out together for our good. That's what the word tells us. And I feel like this is what God wants us to know for next year. In 2018, just keep drinking. Do you see what I've done there? Dance and be thankful. Request some help. Listen to instruction. Take note of the answer. Do it. And keep walking. God wants us to go into this next year, as Pastor Andrew was saying earlier on, with just so much more freedom and healing than you can even think possible. And I've asked, I, I, I believe that God wants to heal some of us today from some stuff. And I've asked the band if they wouldn't mind coming up again this morning at the end. I know we don't normally do this, but I've got the mic, so I can do whatever I like. <laughs> so... I asked the band to come up and I wanted them to, to sing that last song again that we sang in the worship set this morning. And just, I feel like, you know, as God is our healer, Jesus said we are all ministers. Peter, Peter walked down the road and just his shadow healed people. And I want to say this to you. The Holy Spirit that's here today isn't just a shadow. He's here in all his fullness. Because, because he is, because that's who he is. And he wants to heal, he wants to set free, he wants to deliver us today, and he wants to fill us up so that going into 2018, we're getting rid of all our bitterness, we're not complaining about the bitter water, the stuff that's gone wrong, but we're actually thinking about the good stuff that happened this year and the better that is still to come. And I know some of us in the room, you're thinking, you know, I've had aches, pains, injuries, etc., etc. Yesterday when I was thinking about today's sermon, God said this to me. Sometimes our healing doesn't look the way we want it to look, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Sometimes your healing doesn't look like you want it to look like, doesn't mean it's not there. I was told when my arm was, I was born with my arm like this, that's got veins that don't work. And I was told, my mom and dad were told when I was little that by the time I was six or eight, it would stop working. Then they were told when they went back when I was six or eight that by the time I was 12, it would stop working. Then they were told when I was 12, oh, when she hits puberty, it will stop working. No, then it was moved to 21. At 21, I kind of stopped listening. You know what I'm saying? I got saved then and I stopped listening. I started listening to a higher power. My arm doesn't look healed like this one does, but it works. It's been holding this microphone for the entire sermon. Amen. And I know that God wants to do more. I know. I, I, I believe, yes, heal it. But heal here as well. <laughs> this to me is more important. And guys, some of us in this room have got stuff. I, I just want to say to you again, just because your healing doesn't look like you thought it should look, it doesn't mean it's not there. Can we stand up and can we just, can you just between you and God, just have an exchange this morning of whatever area of your life it is 
that you feel like needs healing and bring it to him this morning, whether it's your physical body, aches and pains, disease, whatever it is, whether you feel far from God today and spiritually you just feel like you need something in your spirits or whether it's your emotions. Maybe you're feeling fearful. Maybe you, you're worried about next year. Maybe there's something that's concerning you. Maybe you have been believing a lie about something and you'll know if it's, it's a lie if it doesn't sound like Jesus. And I want you to just bring that stuff before God right now as we go into worship again. And Lord, I'm going to ask that as we sing this song, Father God, of breaking chains and being filled up again, Lord God. I ask, Father, that you would supernaturally come, that you would set us free, that we'd be more free today, going into tomorrow and into this next year than we've ever been before, that we'd be more healed today, going into next year than we've been before, that we'd be more wholehearted today than we've ever been before, going into next year. As we close, I'm going to ask you, just hold a posture of receiving. You know, sometimes when we in the presence of God, we want to release more towards Him, but it's just as valuable and important to stop releasing towards Him and start receiving from Him. So I'm going to ask you not to pray, not to sing. You can't talk while you're drinking. You can't sing while you're drinking. And I want you to just take a moment where you just start to receive from Him. There He is. You don't need to pray. You don't need to sing. You don't need to talk. You just start a drink. You just let Him come and permeate every part of your soul right now. There He is. Dad, as we go from this place today, as we step into 2018, we declare right now that we step out full of you. We declare that wherever we go today, whatever celebrations we have planned to see you in the new year, that we take your glory with us. We take your glory into every event, every family moment. Wherever we go, we are going to bring the kingdom of God, his presence, his healing, his anointing, his grace, his fun because we're full of you. And I declare a blessing over 2018 over every person here. I declare right now that the presence of the Lord surrounds your 2018. I declare that He commands His angels concerning you to guard you and lift you up in their hands that not even a stone will strike against you. I declare grace to persevere through whatever wilderness is coming our way before the promise. To persevere through that to rejoice and pray constantly without ceasing. We receive that. Would you say this with me? Lord, bless us and keep us. Lord, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance on us. Give us your peace now and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Jesus. So good.